Open your Bibles to John chapter 9. We are continuing our series today. Uh, actually, we finished chapter 9. We are in John chapter 10 today, okay? We are starting John chapter 10. And uh, just a quick recap uh, from last week because this, it's, it's important to recap, especially today, because John chapter 9 is not really, that, that conversation is ongoing into chapter 10. And those of you who have a little bit more knowledge about how the Bible was written, uh, there aren't chapter and verses in the original manuscripts of the Bible, okay? It just, it goes and goes and goes and goes, okay? And so the scholars and theologians and those who have tried to make the Bible more accessible and readable and easy to track down certain passages on the go and in your studying have added separators and verses and chapters that are very useful. But chapter 10 starts really in the middle of a uh, discussion that Jesus is having with the Pharisees and those that are around. And so we are continuing that passage today, that discussion in John chapter 10. Now chapter 9 is all about this amazing miracle Jesus does when he heals a man who was born, born blind from birth. And uh, we already went over that in detail the last couple of weeks. Last week we looked at really the responses to that miracle and what the Pharisees had to say about it, what the, the blind man's parents had to say about it, their reaction, their response. And then at the end, we got this beautiful, amazing transformation account of the blind man who now put his faith in Jesus Christ, which is really the highlight of the chapter. The miracle was amazing, but when someone turns to Christ, I mean, that's what it's all about, right? And so we got to see that at the end of chapter 9. <clears throat> And that really highlights the miracle's purpose, which was to point to Jesus. The miracles in this book, in fact, John gives them to us, gives them to the church, so that we might believe that as we read the account of Christ, uh, that it would stir our hearts to believe, that, that we would realize that no ordinary man can do the things that Jesus is doing. It's one thing to say something. It's another thing to do something supernatural that defies uh, human logic, defies science. Especially for the first century church, those who knew of Jesus. Jesus hadn't been gone from the earth that long uh, when John was writing this letter. And so um, it was very... Uh, Jesus and his life, whether you believed in him or, or not, was on the minds of the people there at the time. Whether they witnessed his crucifixion, whether they were people who hated Jesus, you knew about Jesus if you were living in the time of John. So Jesus' miracles point to him. They, they point to his deity. And we see the Pharisees respond in disbelief and and Jesus, in chapter 9, explains to them that he's come to open the spiritual eyes of the blind. He, he gives this amazing miracle that is a picture of the spiritual state of man. That apart from Jesus rescuing us, apart from Jesus touching our blind eyes, we walk in darkness. We walk in spiritual blindness. And... The Pharisees did not receive this word kindly. They didn't receive it at all. In fact, they denied the uh, messianic authority of Jesus Christ. And we see that what happens is that they uh, get so upset with this blind man for being healed by Jesus and for not denouncing Jesus, that it was Jesus who healed him, that they kick him out of the religious synagogue. They, they kick him out as one of those who belong to the Jewish church. They, they kick him out. 
And so what happens? Well, Jesus seeks out the blind man and heals him. Not only does he seek him out and heal his physical eyes, right? We see at the beginning of chapter 9, this man did not know Jesus. He, <clears throat> he knew nothing about him. Jesus sought him out and healed his physical uh, eyes. And then at the end of the chapter, we get this beautiful comparison in harmony with the physical miracle that Jesus seeks out the spiritually blind man and draws him to himself, and the man turns and believes in Jesus Christ and worships him. And that brings us to where we are today. At the very end, the very tail end of John chapter 9, it says in verse 41, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees because they they have overheard the man worshiping Jesus, the blind man, and they have overheard Jesus speaking of, of judgment and, and those who are blind. And in verse 40, some of the, it says, Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Verse 41, Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. Jesus is calling them out for being uh, for not seeing the truth, not uh, they are in their pride, not able to see the truth that Jesus is the Christ, and so it says that their guilt remains. So today we're going to read John chapter ten, and I'm going to read verses one through twenty-one. If you have your Bibles, follow along with me. The, the verses will also be on the on the screen over here, on uh, your left. Here we go, John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out his own, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus uses with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill, sorry, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own hand. I, I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of the words because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Father, we thank you for your word. Pray that as I just read it, that even now it would begin to go into the hearts of those who heard it. Speak to us today. Help it to glorify you, everything that I say from this pulpit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, so there's one main idea I want to 
convey to you today from this passage, and then there's several sub ideas. There are many things in this passage that, that we could go to. And, and I've said this before in John, it, it seems like every chapter there's something happening in the physical realm, but there's also something happening in the spiritual realm. And Jesus is also at the same time uh, revealing uh, theology, right, to the people at the time. And it, it could take weeks to unpack this whole passage. And so I, I'm going to focus in on the major themes that I believe Jesus is uh, conveying here. But there are some themes that I will not really touch on today, specifically in the, in the later portion of the text I read. Um, but just a few quick things before we get into the main idea. Um, we have in verse, uh, let's see, verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Right there, he, he's talking about his resurrection. Okay, we're not going to get into that today, but he's, he's, he's speaking about his life that he's willingly going to lay it down. Right, that even though Jesus was put on the cross, People hated him and wanted him to die. They, they turned him over to the Roman government. They had him put on the cross. Yes, that is true, but it is also true that this was God's plan. It's also true that Jesus gave the authority to these people to crucify him. And so we see God's sovereign will and we see man's decisions in rebellion against God going together. And so that is, that is one thing I, I just want to highlight here at the, at the end of this passage. Another thing I want to highlight is, again, we see that the words that Jesus speaks cause people to be amazed, right? We see at the end, the very end, can a demon open the eyes of the blind, it says, but it also says, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. And so not just the miracles that Jesus was doing, but the words he was speaking proved to people around that he was not insane, right? That was one of the, one of the things people would throw at Jesus at that time was he, was he was a madman, he was insane. And even today, some people would say, yeah, Jesus had some good things to say, but he was, he was a little off, he, he, he was a little insane. And these people... Uh, really point out, hey, he can't be insane because of the way he's talking. It, it, it has, it, it's, it's clear, it's, uh, uh, it, uh, it conveys uh, intellect, right? And so these are just some things that we see in this text that we're not going to really get into today, but I wanted to just point uh, those out. So for today, we just read verses 1 through 21, really our main Text is going to be verses 1 through 18. And the main idea here is that Jesus is the good shepherd that cares for his sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd that cares for his sheep. And we also have in this passage two I am statements. Now, through this book... There are seven I am statements that Jesus gives. And when he's, when he's saying these I am statements, remember, the, these were statements of Jesus that le linked himself to the Old Testament revelation of God. Okay, remember in the Old Testament, God revealed himself to Moses Right, who, who had ran away from Egypt, who had fled Egypt because he had killed a man and he was afraid for his life. He leaves his people, flees to the wilderness, and then God reveals himself to Moses and asks Moses to be his spokesperson. Moses is a little reluctant. There's, there's a lot that is said there between Moses and ha using his brother Aaron and so forth. 
But what Jesus tells him in Exodus chapter 3, verses 14, when Moses is there and God reveals himself through the burning bush, God says to him, I am who I am. And Moses asks God, what should, I, what should I call you? What should I tell the people? When I go before Pharaoh, who should I say sent me? And God said, I am who I am has sent you. And so that is very clear, very uh, definite in the time of Jesus as well. Those who knew the law, the Pharisees, even those who weren't Pharisees who knew the law, if you were a Jew at the time, you knew that the name of God was I am, which in Hebrew we, we would say is Yahweh, right? God, Yahweh, I am and so we have these two I am statements. I want to just point them out real quick. In verse 7, Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Okay? And then in verse 9, it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And then down in verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So the main idea here today, Jesus is the good shepherd that cares for his sheep. Now Jesus uses this analogy of sheep and shepherding throughout this passage. Now to us, this might seem a little outdated. I don't know, in Fredericksburg, it's probably more applicable than in San Antonio where I grew up. You don't see a lot of sheep in San Antonio. I've seen quite a few here. I think they're great, sheep and goats. And, uh, but even more so at the time of Jesus, everybody had sheep. Everybody had cattle. Th this was a primary way of, of life, uh, not, just, uh, not just of uh, living day to day uh, to, to provide food and, and to... Uh, you know, graze in the fields, but to also provide income. You know, uh, shepherding was, was a major part of the economy uh, in Jesus' day. And so when Jesus uses these analogies of, of shepherding and sheep, th this was not anything weird to these people. Uh, uh, in fact, it would be something very near and dear, very relatable to them. So it's important for us to realize that because we can sometimes get disconnected with passages like this that talk about things that for us might not seem that applicable. But in context, this was very applicable to the people of Jesus' day. Shepherding and ranching, it was just a major part of common life in that time. And, and so this conversation of Jesus as the good shepherd as I said, it continues directly from chapter 9, where Jesus had just reprimanded the Pharisees for their spiritual blindness and their pride. So Jesus here is accusing the Pharisees of being a type of false teacher, you could say, a, a religious leader who is leading people astray, is not leading people to repentance, but is leading people into legalism, which we touched on last week as well. These are the thieves and robbers that is being talked about here, leading people away from the true knowledge of Christ. So Jesus is addressing the leaders whose responsibility it is to point to the Messiah. This was the responsibility of the religious leaders to, as John the Baptist was saying, to prepare the way, right? Prepare the way of the Lord. This is not what they were doing. We even see this with the blind man. We touched on it. They wanted him to renounce Christ, and he refused, and they kicked him out of the church. This is how this passage starts. So Jesus begins to explain to the Pharisees three major characteristics that he, as the good shepherd, possesses. This is, this is the main thrust of this message today, that Jesus, as the good shepherd, 
possesses these three characteristics. Now, in this section, you'll notice, and I want to point these out because this is important. There are six objects that we need some clarity on before we go forward. And we see that the first one is this word sheepfold. Okay, this word sheepfold. What this represents is the Jewish people of the day. Okay, the Jewish people. And not only the Jewish people, in in context of the entire New Testament and of our day, it also represents the Gentiles who would later come to Christ. But specifically, when Jesus is addressing these people, they are currently under the law, right? The the old covenant, they are under uh, the promise of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Jesus specifically, when he talks about the sheepfold, those inside the gate, he's talking about the Jewish people. The second thing we, we, the second object we see is, is the thief, the robber. And then later in, in, in verse uh, 6, verse 5, it talks about the stranger, the thief, the robber, the stranger. These are all synonymous. The, these represent the religious leaders who are not following Jesus, who are not leading people to Jesus, who are leading people into legalistic uh, bondage. That's who Jesus is referring to. The third thing is the door. The door represents the only way in and out, right? The only way into the sheepfold of Christ, the only way into the family of God, the only way to become a sheep under the good shepherd is through the door, is through Christ the door of Christ. It is the only way to salvation. The fourth object is the shepherd. Obviously, that represents Jesus Christ. He is the one that we must follow as his sheep. The fifth one is the gatekeeper. Now, this has a two-part meaning. One is the person who is able to recognize the shepherd Right? It's a practical meaning for what Jesus is about to illustrate in the following verses, that the gatekeeper sees the shepherd coming and recognizes him as the shepherd of the sheep and opens the gate. Right? If the gatekeeper does not recognize the shepherd, he does not open the gate. That the thief and the robber has to try to come in Sneak, sneak in a different way, right, if he wants to harm the sheep. There's a second meaning to the gatekeeper that I believe applies to us today, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that for the end, okay? So, so the first application is, is to help us understand uh, kind of the operation of being a shepherd in that time. And I know this is kind of laborious to explain, but at the time there, when in Jesus' day, you had a gatekeeper, and it even talks about it in this passage, right? A hired hand, right? This is what that's talking about in verse 12, right? It says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd. And then it says again, Verse 13, he flees because he's a hired hand, and we'll, we'll get into that, but that's the gatekeeper, okay? The hired hand. So at the time of Jesus, you'd have, you'd have she- shepherds, you'd have people who own sheep, and they would take them, and if they had to go do other work, they would bring them to the sheepfold. They would bring them to the gatekeeper that they had hired, and within the sheepfold, you'd have a lot of different shepherds' sheep, that that it was the responsibility of the gatekeeper to just keep them in until the shepherd returned for his sheep. So that's who the gatekeeper is, the one who recognizes the shepherd. Six, the the final object is the sheep. Who are the sheep of the shepherd? Well, those are the people who are being 
saved, right? To be, a sheep, to be a sheep of the shepherd of God, of Christ, to follow Christ means that it's those who are being saved. Okay, so now that we have all of those objects defined, let's go forward. So the first characteristic that we see that the good shepherd possesses is that the good shepherd gathers his sheep. Jesus, as our good shepherd, he gathers his sheep. Now, what event had just preceded this illustration of the sheep? We, we've already gone over it. Jesus sought out and found the man that the Pharisees cast out, right? He sought him out. He gathered him. And the man also believed and worshipped him. The man, as the sheep of Jesus, followed Jesus. Jesus had just demonstrated this analogy of gathering his sheep through the events that took place in chapter 9. This whole chapter was this analogy. I want to reread verses 1 through 3 of chapter 10. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber, but he who hears, who enters by the door, right? Jesus is the door, is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. He recognizes the shepherd. He opens the door. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Jesus gathers his sheep by calling them. By calling them. And what does he call them by? He calls them by name. He calls his sheep by name because he knows his sheep. This demonstrates for us one of the most unique qualities of our God. The God that we serve. The, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the heavens. Our God is a personal God. He's a personal God. He's not a God that we cannot know. In fact, we can know God because he wants us to know him. He desires for his sheep to know his voice. And you cannot know the shepherd's voice unless you know the shepherd. We read in Isaiah 43, verse 1. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there real quickly. Isaiah 43. This is, this is a passage about the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. Right? Jesus had called the nation, God had called the nation of Israel to be his own special people. And in Isaiah 43, 1, it says, But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, right? He's talking about the nation of Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. We serve a personal God. We serve a God who knows us by name. He didn't find out our name. He gave us our name. He knew our name before the foundations of the world. This is what we see here in verse 3, that the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Jesus gathers his people to himself. Jesus, like a shepherd, will name the sheep that are his. Right? He's able to call them by name because he knows them. And you know what else? He can tell which sheep are his and which aren't. He can tell, that, he can tell those that are following his voice and those that aren't. Any of you who, who have owned sheep, 
you, you can tell the ones that are following along and the ones that, that have yet to, to know your call as a shepherd. This is how Jesus is with us. Verse 3, it says, the sheep hear his voice. So very simply, the people that belong to Jesus can hear his voice. The people that belong to the family of God can hear the voice of God. Now, there are different ways to hear God's voice. We, we talked about one of them in chapter 8, where, where Jesus says that if you abide in my word, verse 31 of chapter 8, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Well, what is a disciple? It's a follower, right? A disciple of Jesus is a follower of Jesus, someone who's following the shepherd is someone who is abiding in his word. What does that word abide mean? It means to live in. If we are living in the word of God, abiding in his word, knowing his word, that is a mark that we are a true follower of him. If we do not know his word, if we don't understand his word, if we don't hear his word, I would argue that we are not following the good shepherd. The good shepherd knows the word of God. Can you hear his voice today? Can you hear him speaking? Are you following closely to Jesus today? Are you close enough to him that, that his spirit is speaking to you? That it's sanctifying you daily? This is what it means to hear the voice of the shepherd as a sheep, as someone who is part of the flock of Christ, the good shepherd. Now, another thing regarding sheep is you may know this already, but sheep are not very smart. Uh, in fact, they're quite dumb. Um, no offense to the sheep. Uh, they don't care anyway because they don't understand uh, sheep are not smart creatures they're not but to the shepherd they have immense value right that's how we are to God we might think we're smart and in human standards we might be smarter than the next guy the next guy might be smarter than us and there are certainly intelligent people and people who are maybe not so intelligent and certainly we saw in chapter 9 that the Pharisees, the most intelligent leaders of the day, Jesus didn't really give a rip about that. He reached, to, he reached the man who was blind. And that man had, was able to have faith in Jesus, not because of his intellect, but because his heart was, was being transformed. And so Jesus uses this metaphor of sheep, I think, to humble us. He uses it intentionally to show us just how helpless people are without the good shepherd. Without the good shepherd, we are just like sheep. We are helpless. We are vulnerable. We, we, we walk, wander aimlessly, right? A sheep without a shepherd will wander aimlessly. We'll, we'll wander off a cliff. We'll wander into... A lion's den, right? We'll wander into a pack of wolves. We'll be devoured. This is what Jesus is showing the Pharisees and, and the Jews at the time that, that they are vulnerable sheep in need of saving, in need of protection, and that Jesus is that good shepherd who loves his sheep and is there to protect them. Verse 3, it says, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. I want to point this out again because this verse goes hand in hand with uh, a verse we've already read uh, in this series in John chapter 6, verse 44. We have this statement from Jesus that says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Here we see it goes hand in hand with verse 3, that if we are to follow Jesus, he first 
calls us, that he calls his sheep by name. Aren't you glad that God knows you by name? Aren't you glad that that when you are searching, when when you were coming to Christ and, and you began to have your heart turned towards God, aren't you glad that you didn't have to convince him to let you into his family? But he was right there calling you into his family because he loves you, because he knows you by name. You, you are not a mystery to God. God isn't walking and saying, oh, oh, hello, so-and-so. Oh, what's your name? Sure, yeah, come along. No, God is seeking us out. God is drawing us to himself by name. He is calling us. He is calling the sheep. And we as sheep, we cannot follow the shepherd unless he leads us. We have to be led out of the sheepfold into the pastures, into green pastures. We have to be led out of the sheepfold. We have to follow Jesus. We have to walk through the gate. We can't climb over the fence. We got to walk through the gate behind the good shepherd. Jesus is gathering his sheep today. The good shepherd is gathering his sheep even today. And he wants to use us as his other sheep, as the sheep that are already following him. He wants to use us to help him gather his sheep. The second thing, the second characteristic is that Jesus guards his sheep. So the good shepherd gathers his sheep and the good shepherd guards his sheep. Jesus expands on this metaphor in verses 7 through 10. So let's look at those verses again real quickly here. Verse 7 through 10 of John 10. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus calls himself here, I am the door. I am the door of the sheep. So Jesus is the one who keeps the sheep safe from those wanting to harm the sheep, those wanting to take advantage of the sheep, that Jesus keeps his children safe. In this instance, he keeps the sheep safe. The good shepherd guards his sheep. If you are a shepherd, this is something you have to do, right? Think think about, if you don't have sheep, just think about being a father or a mother If you are protecting something that is of value to you, you have to take precautions. You have to constantly know where they're at. You have to constantly be calling them, be drawing them, be speaking to them, and they have to be listening. And it's the shepherd's job to protect the sheep from harm. It's the shepherd's job to be aware that there might be thieves and robbers who want to take advantage of the sheep. And I'm thankful that we follow a shepherd who at this very moment is interceding on our behalf. At this very moment is keeping us under his wing, the Bible says. That we are secure, that our salvation is secure as followers, as sheep in the, in the sheepfold of the good shepherd who is Christ. He's the only one who can keep us safe. And again, he references here the, the, the thieves, the robbers. He's calling out the Pharisees. The people in that day that, that the Pharisees were deceiving them to believe that their own works and keeping the law is what would grant them favor in God's eyes, what would save them. 
They were being led into legalism, spiritual bondage, right? These are the robbers. These are the thieves. And Jesus is telling them that he is the only door to salvation. Jesus, by, by explaining this analogy, is protecting and guarding his sheep. He is helping his sheep to see there is only one way to salvation. Don't listen to what these other people are saying. Follow me. Come through my door. Follow me as your good shepherd. Verse 9 and 10. Talk about that. Talk about the door. No one enters by me. Only those who enter by me will be saved. Jesus is the shepherd that keeps his sheep from destruction and deception. This is the good news for us today as Christians. Those of us who are in his sheepfold, who are disciples of Christ, who do follow the good shepherd. Not only does the good shepherd guard us from the lies of the enemy, but it says here he also gives us life and life abundantly. This this is something that is amazing about our shepherd is that he is a gracious shepherd that as that as our father he gives gracious gifts to his children that he gives us eternal life. He doesn't just save us from the pit of hell, he elevates us into all eternity with him. So, the good shepherd guards his sheep. The third characteristic we, sh- we see of the shepherd is that a good shepherd who values his sheep will give his life for his sheep. Will give his life for his sheep. Verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. What separates Jesus Christ from all other religions, all other gods, is that he willingly, Christ willingly pursued us, willingly pursued us, willingly saved us, and willingly sacrificed himself for us. There's no other God that has done anything like that. This is the God that we serve. This is our shepherd, that he would sacrifice himself willingly for his sheep. This is what the good shepherd does. Now in verse 12, as I mentioned earlier, we have the the gatekeeper, the hired hands. I mentioned there was a secondary meaning to this. Now the gatekeeper recognizes the good shepherd. But when the tough gets, when the tough things come and the thieves come and the wolves come, sometimes the gatekeeper isn't quite cut out to protect the sheep. Why? Because they're not his. They're not really his sheep. And so he's not willing to lay down his life for those sheep. And so the second meaning that I see in this gatekeeper is it's really a picture of some pastors in in ministry, some leaders in ministry, not all, but some, that when things get hot, when things get intense, when the fire is are rising within the church. Sometimes leaders just bail. They say, I'm not cut out for this. Why? Because they're human. 
because they, they, they are falling short, right? They're definitely falling short in the call that God has for them. When we see pastors fall or pastors leave the ministry or they're not willing to stick things out um, because of well, whatever reason. But this, this is not a limitation of necessarily character as it is just being human. There's only one good shepherd. And what this shows us is that we have to follow the shepherd. We have to follow the good shepherd. You guys, y'all, men and women have to follow the good shepherd. You can't be looking to me. You can't be looking to someone on YouTube, right, to, to, to follow for, for, your, for your salvation. You have to look to Jesus. I have to put my eyes on Jesus alone because people will fail. Gatekeepers will come and go, and some will be able to stick it out. Some will be able to effectively stick it out, but, but some will make mistakes. Some will... will I I may make mistakes. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus as the good shepherd, we are protected, we are guarded. And the promise we have from Jesus is that as our good shepherd, he is willing to lay down his life for us. That when trials come, we look to his word. We look to his promises that he will protect us that he will keep us. And even beyond that, nothing I say or do from this pulpit can save your soul. I have to point to Jesus. You have to put your faith in Jesus. And then when you leave this earth, your soul is secure because you've put your faith in the words of the book, the words that Jesus spoke, the word of God. And so in closing today, I I just want to reemphasize that Jesus is the good shepherd who cares for his sheep, that we are his sheep. Those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, we are now a part of that sheepfold. We are now a part of the family of God. And Jesus, as our good shepherd, he has gathered us, he has called us, This is good news that Jesus, even today, is drawing people to himself. We need to believe that Jesus is still in the saving business today, that we we need to be praying for our loved ones. We need to be speaking the truth to them, that as the word goes out, as the word of God goes forward, as the gospel goes forward from our lips, the Bible says that people are transformed by hearing the word of God. Because the word of God has power. That is one of the ways that God draws people to himself is by hearing the word of God. And so we have a part to play. We have to be people that, yes, we are now in the sheepfold, but we're not stuck in the pen. We can can go in and out, as as it uses the metaphor here of the pasture. We can go in to the world and preach the good news of Jesus Christ and Pray for the salvation of those who have yet to believe and believe that God is gathering his sheep, that Jesus is drawing the sheep. And two, Jesus guards the sheep. Jesus is guarding us today. We can have security in our salvation today. We can know that we know that we know that we are saved if we are following Christ, if we are following his word. And then third, Jesus is willing to sacrifice his life for the sheep. This is the promise we have, that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, our sin that separated us from God, separated us from the Father, that Jesus paid the ultimate price, died on the cross for our sin, something that none of us in here could ever do. As much as I love each one of you, As much as I love my family, my children, I could die for them physically, but nothing I could do could save their soul. It takes a work of the cross, 
a work of Christ. And that's what the good shepherd does as he sacrifices himself for his sheep. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for sending Christ to pursue us. Lord, apart from Jesus coming to the earth, we have no way to salvation. We have no way to a relationship with you. But you sent the good shepherd to call us by name. And as we respond in faith, we follow the good shepherd. And he leads us into safety. He leads us through the one door that secures our salvation. And Lord, we also know that he guards us, that as we follow him, as we follow him, as we follow the word, there's safety there. There's protection. There's the promises of God. And Lord, the good shepherd also lays his life down for us. And we thank you for that eternal hope that we have, that one day we will be in the presence of Jesus, celebrating with the saints for all eternity. Help us to have that in our hearts burning so that we can carry your light into a desperate, needy world that needs your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.